Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Way welcome to our final issue briefing of the World Economic Forum Annual Meeting 2015. Thanks for joining us, and a big welcome to our, our viewers watching on our webcast platform at WeForum. Org. By way of very brief introduction for those who haven't joined us for issue briefings, these are not announcements, they're not press conferences, they are an opportunity to interact with um, experts from some of the key content sessions and, and, and parts of the program that have been going on up in the uh, more salubrious parts of the Congress Centre. This one actually is uh, of particular interest as we uh, look towards the closing of the annual meeting. It's an issue briefing on the future of security, not a subject uh, or an issue that is covered um, as often or in as, such, as much depth in uh, previous meetings. I'm uh, hopefully going to find out more. I'll just introduce my panel and we'll go over to questions. First, on uh, my immediate left, I'm honored to be joined by Espen Bart Eider, my colleague, member of the Managing Board at the World Economic Forum. Espen is Head of Center for Global Strategies. Um, next to Espen, Jean-Marie Gueno, the President and Chief Executive Officer at the International Crisis Group based in Belgium, and also a member of the Forum's Global Agenda Council on Fragility, Violence and Conflict. Now, there will be time for questions, both from journalists in the room and also over social media. First of all, I'd just like to invite our two panellists to offer some remarks on, on this issue. Espen, starting with you. Thank Why are we seeing such a focus on security here at the annual meeting? Thank you, Oli. Well, I think that's actually a quite natural reaction to uh, recent developments, and I'm not only talking about the recent weeks, but the recent years. Um, the world is getting even more complex. Uh, I think it's also even more important than, uh, I would say, for many, many years to really understand how the global international security landscape interacts with the global economy and regional economy. And for a forum that tries to understand the general trajectory of the world and the world economy and society, we need to understand uh, the security landscape. And I think it's good to, just as a start, to remind ourselves how fast things change. We, we were here exactly a year ago at the end of the World Economic Forum 2014. There was no war in Ukraine, nobody spoke about the Islamic State, uh, um, and, uh, and the world can really change very fast. And what we are arguing, and has been a major theme throughout these uh, many panels in this area, is that uh, while we are continuing to see uh, a number of security issues related to so-called asymmetric threats, non-state actors, state collapse, and so on, we're also seeing a high degree of strategic competition being back, meaning that key countries, key economies uh, that used to cooperate are now cooperating less and competing more, sometimes violently, other times through economic means, and that may actually suggest uh, a major change in how the world looks. So for the World Economic Forum, we thought it was natural to put more emphasis on this type of issue. Jean-Marie, last week the Forum published its Global Risks report, and uh, conflict actually emerged as the number one risk in terms of outcome. Um, as uh, overlooking the 10-year uh, the time horizon um, in which the, the report covered. In your capacity as head of International Crisis Group, do you agree with this prognosis, chilling as it may be? Well, I do think that we are going to see more and more what I would call geopolitical black swans. Uh, it's an expression that is familiar in the financial world, but more and more we see that it's politics that surprises us. I mean, as uh, Espen uh, just mentioned, we had, uh, we had two geopolitical surprises last year. I think what's happening is that we have conflicts that represent the traditional threats of force, so to speak. That's all the concerns we have, for instance, in the South China Sea and the, in Asia. And we have conflicts that are a reflect of uh, the threats of weakness, so to speak. When states who are, in a way, the guardians of the international order are no more the guardians of their own space. And that's what we have seen in the Sahel. That's uh, what we see in the, in the Middle East. And the most worrying trend for me is when the two converge. That is, when you see interstate rivalry then uh, using the weakness of some parts of the world. And certainly Ukraine was, I mean, uh, uh, had serious problem for many years. And uh, the Ukrainian crisis probably would not have happened if it had been a strong, a strong state. And so that combination of strategic rivalry with state weakness is a major new uh, characteristic of the strategic landscape, and it, it is a cause for concern. Asymmetric threats, strategic competition. Is this the new normal, Espen? Well, I, I, 
I don't want to sound too pessimistic because I'm, I'm, I'm fundamentally an optimist and I think the world can be made better through uh, cooperation and, and, you know, will to invest in common solutions. But right now, I think it's uh, abnormal. Uh, and in a sense, we, we may look back at the last two decades and say that we've been living in a world of an ever-expanding uh, global economy, which uh, you know used to be what we could call the Western economy plus, and then expanded into areas like Russia, China, uh, and many other parts of the world, and basically sharing some basic principles about how we interact with each other. Now, the question is, how long will that go on? Uh, with the, uh, we see that what happened in Ukraine, for instance, has led to the return of sanctions, sanctions being used uh, and uh, replied to by counter sanctions at the level that we wouldn't have expected even a year ago. And that is why we part of our focus on security is also <coughs> a focus on geoeconomics, which has uh, on a very general level means the interplay between the global politi political affairs and global economic affairs, but which can also be interpreted as the use of economic tools for political strategic purpose to hurt an adversary, for instance, sometimes a tool that is used when one is not willing to use a military tool. So that, again, demonstrates that this is something we might have to get used to. But we should also think about how we can overcome this, how we can rebuild trust, how we can get key leaders, nations, others to work together and try to rebuild uh, relations and also strengthen international organizations because I fundamentally believe that the more, the stronger the international regime, regimes and rules and organizations are, the better we are as human beings on this planet because um, there are, as you all know, a lot of issues which we should have been dealing with, so like the climate, global health issues, but which in a sense has come in the shadow of this return of strategic competition. Yeah, thanks. And, and of course, we're happy to take questions from the floor. We also have some from social media. Does anybody have any questions here in the room? One that's just coming over social media, um, maybe uh, Jean-Marie, maybe both of you could, could answer this. Um, how is conflict being waged? What are the, what are the new tools that, that we're seeing? Well, conflict is no more conflict between armies of, a, of two states. Conflict now is waged on several fronts. There is the, the traditional battlefields. There's a battlefield of information. There's a cyber uh, um, battlefield. And there are also new actors of conflict. There are proxies. There are semi-proxies. There are militias that, have some under, that are under some influence but not full control. So waging conflict today is very different from any, any previous uh, conflict. The cyber dimension is something that is coming up more and more um, because with cyber, cyber warfare, you can kill as many people or more than with a bomb if you disrupt uh, critical infrastructure, water distribution, uh, air traffic control. That can lead to mass uh, casualties. And so this uh, dimension is something that is not yet really very much in the forefront, but that will become more and more important. And I, if I can add to that, uh, Oli, that um, I think we uh, are way beyond realizing now that if an, any future conflict between reasonably advanced states or, or, or reasonably advanced actors uh, in the future from now on and, and in, in eternity, I think, will will also be waged in the cyberspace. It may or may not be waged on the battlefield or at sea or in the air, but it will definitely also have a cyber dimension, which means that uh, uh, cyberspace, which is uh, so much an area of uh, new solutions and communication and ways to do things smarter and better, is also an area in which we are threatened, both as individuals and states. And that's why we also have that as part of this broader discussion. Thank you. Let's just go back to the, um, the the prognosis you were painting earlier with regards to non-state actors. Are they here to stay? Yes, sadly. Uh, we see a crisis of the state in many parts of the world. Uh, it's linked to a, a variety of factors. It's linked to uh, a transnational movement. It's linked to the difficulty of state to control their own space, to the mobility of uh, people. Uh, it's linked to a crisis of politics. And the result is that non-state actors sometimes have almost as much power as some uh, weak states. And so the, qu the challenge of how you manage weakly governed spaces, uh, not ungoverned spaces, because every space is governed one way or another, sometimes governed by parallel structures, but it is governed. But when you want to address the, the, the challenge of weakly governed, governed spaces, you're going to address 
uh, a challenge is going to, to grow. You see in large parts of the Sahel that is the situation. You see now that in large parts of Syria and Iraq uh, that is the situation, in parts of Yemen that is the situation, in parts of, uh, Pak of uh, Pakistan and uh, Afghanistan it is uh, the situation. So this is a situation that's going to stay with us. And for that, you need to develop adequate responses. After a decade and a half of interventionism, U.S. interventionism, U.N. interventionism, there is sometimes a sense that it's just uh, it's too difficult, a uh, sense that one gives up. I think, uh, as we had discussions with them in a variety of security actors uh, here in Davos, uh, there's an understanding that one cannot give up, uh, but that one has to really draw the lessons of what has been done right and what has been done wrong in the last uh, 15 years. Uh, if you could just wait for a microphone for the benefit of our audience, and please give us your name and your, your organization. Uh, my name is Anna. I'm from Veja, a Brazilian magazine. Uh, pre uh, French President François Hollande and also John Kerry, uh, yesterday they were talking about um, more cooperation between countries to discuss the conflicts and solutions to conflicts. Uh, how to engage co more countries in that discussion? I mean, emerging markets, emerging countries, are they discussing enough at this kind of global issue, or do you think they are a bit uh, separated from this kind of discussion? If I'm Please. Uh, that's an excellent question, and I think um, a country like Brazil and many of the other emerge, large players who are emerging not only economically but also becoming more important on the global scene. I think a, a, a big part of the answer to this broader question of global organization is whether to the extent to the extent to which these states are ready not only to look after their own interests but also be partners in in managing and carrying the system because of course back Back in the heyday of uh, you know um, what some people would call American hegemony or American Pax Americana, the U.S. did not only look after U.S. interests, but it took a kind of a systemic approach. Some thought that was good, others thought that was not so good. The point is that there was kind of an organizing role. The America is quite clearly saying that they're not able to do that at the same level as they once were. That has been said by President Obama. It was said by John Kerry here yesterday which means that a number of new states need to take more of that responsibility, So, which is more than just saying, I want my share, which is perfectly fair. It's also saying, I want to be responsible. Now, and I think that to the extent that the merchant countries sees that and takes that responsibility, which would mean contributing economically, politically, maybe at times militarily to international crisis management, um, the better we would be off. But it should happen in the framework of international organizations. They can be global, but it can also be about strengthening regional organizations. But because in many parts of the world, maybe the best we can hope for is that the neighborhood takes the responsibility to help uh, weakly governed space to become a more better governed space. And uh, in, in your region, I would say that a good example is Colombia. It's a country that may now be uh, at the end of a very long conflict. And uh, I am happy to say that I know since I worked on this in my previous capacity as Norwegian foreign minister, that uh, regional co players uh, are playing a constructive role in trying to help Colombia into its final phase uh, towards peace. Don't you think that maybe it's because of uh, the past of uh, military di dictator dictatorship uh, in those countries? Maybe that they are a bit, uh, I don't know, they don't want to enter so much on that di military discussion and conflict dis dis discussion because of because they have some, um, I don't know, they, they don't want to talk about military any anymore. Who are they? Uh, all the countries that have been through dictatorship during yeah. the 70s and 60s. I'm talking yeah, about yeah. Latin America right. especially. No, that, that, um, that but I mean, there are many other ways. Yeah, but the thing is that there are many other ways to take a global responsibility than through uh, soldiers and military might. I mean, there's economic, there's diplomatic tools, there's uh, cooperation, there's trade. The point, the point is very much whether... Um, the extent to which we can fill the vacuum that will be left by a U.S. that is less engaged uh, by uh, more collaboration between the countries that are now becoming more wealthy and hence should take more of a responsibility. And I think those those who come from 
Western countries who used to be those calling the shots, and I'm talking metaphorically here, not, not, not concretely, it, also have to be prepared that uh, we have to share this planet with political leaders from, from other parts of the world and also for maybe other traditions of thinking. And frankly, this international engagement, it has a greater chance of success when it has a broader base, because it, it, that increases its legitimacy, and legitimacy is a big part of, of success. I mean, if you, if you intervene in the lives of others, you have to be accepted. Uh, you have to be welcome. Uh, I think that has been the case with I mean, the efforts of Latin America in Haiti, uh, which uh, really brought a lot of uh, Latin American countries uh, to, together, and Brazil and playing a leadership uh, role there. Uh, so broadening the base of countries that engage in uh, stabilizing countries uh, with only partly a military instrument, just the broad range of instruments, is essential to addressing the question of weekly governed space. Sir, and again, could, it, could we have your name and organization, please? Uh, Katsuhiko Hara from Nikkei, Japanese newspaper. I have a question on uh, intelligence. What can, what are the obstacles for major powers to shut the um, terrorist group from their supply of finance or supply of weapons or, you know, how is it really hard to get into the black market to cut them off the supplies? So cutting the supply of finance from terrorist organizations. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is hard because there are multiple uh, sources of, uh, of funding. Uh, the fact that the terrorist group are not states, that they are very amorphous uh, structures that continually uh, change, uh, makes it very difficult to... To, to track uh, their finance. But there is, I mean, a growing effort, actually, at tracking uh, uh, financial movements around the world. So you look at the Islamic State. I mean, what happens is that they take control of the uh, oil wells, and then they uh, sell the oil through middlemen. And that's where it gets complicated, because if obviously if they wanted to sell the oil directly, that could be stopped. Uh, when it is the middlemen, then you have to to follow the track, and that becomes much more difficult. But, the, but this answer, which I, to which I totally agree, also me illustrates that actually working against, for instance, uh, financial uh, support to terrorism can also be, in many ways, the same work as when you look for ways to um, eradicate corruption or uh, avoid sort of tax evasion and so on, because it means a more better uh, oversight of uh, the economic flows can have many positive benefits. And I think, in a sense, there are some secondary effects of looking more deeply into those issues, which are positive. Gentlemen, and before we close this, uh, this, this fascinating discussion, I'd just like you to um, set out, even though this is a, a long-term study, and there's the beginning of a, of a journey of, of work at the forum and um, at the ICG, of course, you have a very long horizon. But what are your priorities for 2015? Jean-Marie. For me, at Crisis Group, when looking at all the conflicts that are developing in weekly governed spaces, the priority is prevention. Because what we see is that once a conflict has started, it's very difficult to end. And the more it lasts, the more difficult in a way it is to end, because it, frag it fragments. And so I think the focus of the international community should be much more on prevention. And I would say that from the forum side, of course, there are certain we're not, we're not a traditional diplomatic organization. We're not an international organization of member states. So there's a limit to what we can do in stopping conflicts. But of course, we, do, we can at times provide a discrete platform for uh, background talks, for instance, between uh, uh, parties to a conflict. But um, uh, where we can have the most influence, I think, is in the immediate recovery, where we can try to engage with our membership with uh, key economic actors, public and private, together in seeing how we can uh, lock in a positive process once it started. Because there are many cases where you actually stop a conflict, and then there's an expectation of rapid growth and uh, economic development and social development, and it's not happening, and then you go into a negative cycle. So mobilizing a broad public-private approach can sometimes be the best way of actually proving that there's a peace dividend which makes people's lives better, and hence takes away the uh, temptation to go back to war or conflict or terrorism. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Well, we'll close this issue brief now. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Thanks to, for you for joining us here in the basement and also our audience watching us online. Thank you.